Hi everyone, I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom, here on WHOS Stores 91.7 FM. So thank you very much for tuning into my show this morning. We are going to be talking about, on the show today, something that both the Democrats and the Republicans can agree on. Uh, you often hear about this uh, in politics, that they can't ever agree on anything. They can't get any laws passed because, you know, they're constantly battling each other and they won't ever agree to, uh, you know, get things done in Congress. Well, I'll tell you that there is something that both the Democrats and the Republicans agree wholeheartedly on, and that is the policy of eternal war forever. Uh, it seems like whenever you turn on the television, there is a constant stream of warfare that is happening around the world, whether it is the ISIS situation in the Middle East, where there's a more military presence being put there. Uh, we're still at war in Afghanistan. Not a lot of people talk about that as much anymore, but that's you know still happening. We also have the Ukraine situation, where that was uh, quite a calamity for quite some time, and that's right on the border of Russia, which is an extremely dangerous and volatile situation to be involved with. And uh, now there's war against diseases, you know, war against everything, really. War against poverty, war against whatever, you name it. And did you know that this is the seventh country that the U.S. has now invaded and bombed under the current presidency that we have right now? Uh, not even George W. Bush did that. I think it was uh, three that he invaded and bombed. But our Nobel Peace Prize winning president has invaded seven countries and bombed them as we speak. And so war... War is something that the left and the right both agree on, and I'd like to read an article uh, confirming this from Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S.org, and it is called The Left and Right Agree. War is Popular. Common wisdom would purport that those on the so-called right are and always have been hawkish and pro-war, while those on the proverbial left have always been the tree-hugging, peacenik, anti-war folks. For many conservatives, unfortunately, this is more or less correct. However, progressives have once again airbrushed their own past, which is about as anti-war as, well, war. Much of this perception is relatively recent, and primarily boils down to the Iraq War. The neoconservative warmongering was in full swing, and for his part, Barack Obama gave a rather pleasant speech about his opposition to the war before it began. In his book, Obama elaborated, quote, What I sensed, though, was that the threat Saddam posed was not imminent. The administration's rationales for war were flimsy and ideologically driven, and the war in Afghanistan was far from complete. Not terribly bad, at least for a politician. Obama then proceeded to escalate the war in Afghanistan, go to war with Libya without congressional approval, authorize airstrikes in Iraq, as well as drone strikes in Yemen, Somalia, and Pakistan, while saber-rattling at Syria, Iran, and the Ukraine. Even the American withdrawal from Iraq he oversaw, which is now being ballyhooed by clueless neoconservatives, was hardly different than the schedule George W. Bush had already agreed to. Indeed, as far as democratic and ostensibly progressive politicians were concerned, Obama was actually abnormally in his tepid opposition to the Iraq war. The Senate Democrats voted in favor of letting George Bush go to war 25 to 20. Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, Dianne Feinstein, and John Kerry all voted yes. Furthermore, it wasn't long ago that the supposedly conservative Republicans were the ones against the war and the supposedly liberal Democrats in favor of it. The big difference seemed to be nothing more than which party's politician was in office. For example, regarding the military action in Kosovo in 1999, Senate Republicans opposed the resolution giving Clinton authorization for military action 13-32, to while the Democrats supported it 38-3. to the 2000 Republican Party platform even criticized the Democrats for being too militaristic abroad. Only later, after almost unanimous support on both sides of the aisle for the war in Afghanistan, did the parties switch for Iraq. Well, sort of switched. Progressive opposition to the Iraq war has been very much exaggerated. Both the left liberal New York Times and Washington Post backed the war. 
Thomas Friedman, Christopher Hitchens, Jacob Weisberg, George Packer, and Jonathan Chait all supported the invasion. Current senator and liberal favorite Al Franken noted that, quote, I believed Colin Powell. I believed the presumption that the president is telling the truth. So I thought, I guess we have to go to war. The popular liberal blogger Matt Iglesias explained his support for the war as having been because he, quote, adhered to the school of thought popular at the time, which held that one major problem in the world was that the U.S. government was unduly constrained in the use of force abroad by domestic politics. In other words, progressives weren't getting as much war in the 90s as they would have preferred. Sure, most of them eventually repudiated their former support, with the notable exception of Christopher Hitchens. But almost everyone outside of a few neoconservative perma-hawks have done the same. When Republican Congressman Dana Rohrabacher was asked in 2010 how many of his Republican colleagues thought the war was a mistake, he responded, quote, I will say that the decision to go in, in retrospect, almost all of us think that was a horrible mistake. Being against the Iraq war now is kind of like being against slavery now. It's certainly the correct moral position, but it's not a particularly brave or impressive stance to take. And while there were more on the left who opposed the Iraq war from the beginning, it must be noted that anti-war movement amongst progressives quickly dissipated as soon as Barack Obama was elected. And while some on the left have opposed Obama's many interventions, albeit quietly, you'll find more support than opposition amongst progressives for Obama's, quote, kinetic military actions. For example, Nancy Pelosi was pushing a war with Syria, while progressive favorite Elizabeth Warren wants to bomb Iraq. DNC chair Michael Zinn even channeled his inner neoconservative by declaring that Rand Paul, quote, blames America for all the problems in the world because of Paul's unfortunately short-lived criticism of intervening in Iraq once again. Before airstrikes began in Libya, Slate ran articles titled, quote, Don't Let Qaddafi Win, and, quote, Why Obama Doesn't Need to Ask Congress Before Attacking Libya. And it was no different for Syria, as Slate r- writer Fred Kaplan opined, quote, Obama's rationale for military strikes, which I agree with, puts him in a box. The organizations charged with enforcing international law are not joining in the attack. The UN Security Council is paralyzed. To gain some measure of legitimacy, Obama at least needs domestic support. And so, in addition to announcing that he decided to launch an attack on Syrian targets, he also announced that he would have Congress debate and vote on a resolution authorizing military force. So Slate, the popular progressive online magazine, supports the president asking Congress for authorization to go to war, but only when it is not practical or possible for the president to go to war on his own accord. Now that is a peace-loving position, if there ever was one. Democratic voters haven't been much better. According to a Pew study, Democrats were slightly more likely, 47% to 45%, to support, quote, conducting airstrikes in Libya than Republicans. Furthermore, again according to Pew, only 19% of Democrats were opposed to taking military action against Iraq in January 2002. When the war began, it was only 37%, and that number didn't cross the halfway mark until 2004. It is important to note that Democrat is not a synonym for progressive, and the party of old cannot be directly compared to the party of today. Still, generally speaking, the Democrats have supported greater economic control and redistribution by the federal government, at least since the New Deal. In other words, the Democrats have, generally speaking, been the party of the progressives. Thereby, it is not insignificant to point out that the United States became involved in all four major American wars in the 20th century with Democratic presidents in office. Woodrow Wilson in World War I, Franklin Roosevelt in World War II, Harry Truman in the Korean War, and Lyndon Johnson in the Vietnam War. Indeed, in an interesting piece of research, Gallup found that the partisan difference regarding Iraq didn't exist for Vietnam. In 1965, more Republicans were opposed to military action in Vietnam than Democrats, 28% to 22%. The sides didn't switch until about 1970 and remained close throughout the war. 
Of course, many on the left have been consistently opposed to war. The socialist Eugene Debs was even imprisoned during World War I for denouncing America's participation in the conflict. And sometimes, unfortunately, it appears that such leftists are not so much anti-war, but simply on the other side. For example, while the American involvement in Vietnam was an abomination, that doesn't mean Ho Chi Minh's communist regime was something to celebrate. And it's hard to make the case that Jane Fonda was being anti-war when she was photographed sitting on a North Vietnamese anti-aircraft gun, or that Noam Chomsky was pushing for peace while shilling for Pol Pot and Khmer Rouge during the killing fields in Cambodia. And, in general, the mainstream progressives of old were even more pro-war than the conservatives. For instance, the staunch progressive William Jennings Bryan was an adamant supporter of the Spanish-American War. In the words of historian William Letcherberg, quote, few political figures exceed the enthusiasm of William Jennings Bryan for the Spanish War. Thomas Woods further observes, quote, the humanitarian aspect of the war, namely liberating Cuba from Spanish rule, appealed to progressives. The response of feminist leader Elizabeth Cady Stanton was typical. Though I hate war per se, she wrote, I am glad that it has come in this instance. I would like to see Spain swept from the face of the earth. World War I was even worse. Theodore Roosevelt, who started the explicitly progressive Bull Moose Party, was more adamant than anyone about getting the United States involved in World War I. In fact, most progressives were in favor of the First World War, including Walter Lippmann, Herbert Crowley, and John Dewey. Murray Rothbard describes Dewey's activism on the matter as follows, quote, John Dewey prepared himself to lead the parade for war as America drew nearer to armed intervention in the European struggle. First, in January 1916, in The New Republic, Dewey attacked, quote, the professional pacifists' outright condemnation of war as a sentimental fantasy, a confusion of means and ends. Force, he declared, was simply a means of getting results, and therefore could neither be lauded nor condemned, per se. And the progressive support for war continued throughout World War II to the Korean War. Opposition to the war in Korea was scarce, but the little that was found was mostly on the old right, led by Robert Taft. It wasn't until the Vietnam War was well underway that any real anti-war movement could be found on the left. And as the politics of today show, a consistent anti-war sentiment is a minority opinion on the left. History is crystal clear that progressives have not been universally or even mostly opposed to war. Conservatives are in general no better, and of recent, they're somehow even worse. Thereby, it's quite unlikely that a cure for the festering rot known as the warfare state will come from the right. But, given its history, such a cure will probably not come from the left either. That article was by Andrew Sirius, and uh, it's called Left and Right Agree, War is Popular. And it was uh, published on Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S dot org. Now, libertarians, on the other hand, you know, as compared to the left and the right, we are vehemently opposed to war. It's one of the reasons why I talk about it so much on this show. It's one of the reasons why I try to explain the libertarian position that war is automatically aggression. It's mass violence. It's mass killing and murder uh, on a very vast scale. And uh, every innocent that is killed in a war is uh, something that should never, ever happen in a free society under any circumstances. Uh, no one can be aggressed against under any condition whatsoever. This is a violation of the non-aggression principle, which is the core of the libertarian philosophy. So we see war as one of the greatest calamities of mankind. And uh, one of my favorite bumper stickers in, in our movement is, uh, I'm already against the next war, because we don't really care what the war actually is, unless it is purely a defensive war. And we would argue that in America's history, there has only been two just wars uh, that have been fought purely on a defensive level. One was the American Revolution, defending ourselves from Britain after we decided to secede from Britain. And the second was the South, defending themselves from Lincoln's invasion uh, after def uh, defining their secession from the American Empire. 
And so we're already against the next war unless it's a war of defense. And almost no wars have been a war of defense. Almost all of them have been wars of aggression to bully, to threaten, and to intimidate, to gain power over another uh, group of people on the planet. So I think a, a valid question to ask here is why? Why does war keep happening? Why does it continue to crop up around us? Uh, one answer, I believe, is the uh, profit ability of the wars, uh, the military-industrial complex, the people who create all the armaments, who are then generally kind of sold to both sides uh, of the you know, conflicted regions of the world. Uh, the bankers also benefit immensely because they get to lend out all this money to the governments who then buy up all these armaments, which they then use to fight each other. Uh, so there's a lot of people who have their hands in the cookie jar, um, I think another reason that the military conflicts seem to keep popping up is uh, control. Uh, so the domestic population who goes to war is generally more willing to accept their freedom being taken from them by the political class if they're under some duress, um, if there's a fear of some impending conflict or impending enemy coming to attack them, then they're generally more willing to concede uh, their rights up to that ruling class. And uh, to talk a little bit more about this, I want to turn to Bionic Mosquito, who's available at uh, bionicmosquito.blogspot.com. And uh, he's going to talk about how war is really for control. Not oil, not military industrial profits, not the bankers. War is for the purpose of control. Control of the most valuable, renewable resource on the planet, people. Control through the toolkit of regulatory democracy if possible, authoritarian rule where the population is not as easily fooled. The elite of the Anglo-West pursue this objective since the great rapprochement between Britain and the United States in the late 19th century. The primary tool for Western control of the world's population has been the United States government. Justin Raimondo is out with a post entitled, Why This War? In it, he describes progressivism as the motor behind this push, progressivism rooted in early 20th century America just at the time when the elite purposely moved their primary tool from Britain to the United States. Quote, America's ruling elite has been progressive since the dawn of the modern age, right before the First World War. Raimondo then cites Rothbard writing of this period and movement from Rothbard, quote, in his editorial in the magazine's first issue in November 1914, Herbert Crowley cheerily prophesied that the war would stimulate America's spirit of nationalism and therefore bring it closer to democracy. True, European war collectivism was a bit grim and autocratic, but, never fear, America could use the self-same means for democratic goals. As America prepared to enter the war, the new republic eagerly looked forward to imminent collectivization, sure that it would bring, quote, immense gains in national efficiency and happiness. After war was declared, the magazine urged that the war be used as an aggressive tool of democracy. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I recall that when many use the term democracy, they do not mean Switzerland, they mean something akin to communism. Raimondo points out that it was usually the Democrats, the liberals, that led the effort or push for war and for global reaching institutions. Wilson, FDR, Truman, LBJ. Bush II could be considered an exception to this role. Quote, the ideology has a name. We call it progressivism. It has a long history, starting with Teddy Roosevelt and his intellectual publicists, continuing through the Great War and up to World War II, when it was the left that was screaming for U.S. intervention in the European conflict and its aftermath. There was no U.S. interest in the Great Wars of the first half of the 20th century, not if by, quote, U.S. interest, one means of interest or benefit to the vast majority of people living within the geographic boundaries of the United States. There was certainly a necessity for the U.S. to involve itself in these wars if it was to fulfill its calling as the replacement tool for global government. 
quote, This is why our foreign policy consists of endless war, as Greenwald puts it. Because if your goal is world domination, then the war to establish a global authority with Washington as its capital must be necessarily open-ended. That's because there will always be resistance to such a project. Once a rebellion is put down in the Middle East, for example, another one is more likely to pop up in Africa or Eastern Europe or someplace else. It is the intent toward global control and the rebellion to it that is the answer to why the wars. People rebel, not oil, not gas pipelines, just people. It is the people that are to be brought under control globally. The empire builders will, in the end, fail. We are living through the transition. It may be a long one. That article was by the Bionic Mosquito. You can find him on bionicmosquito.blogspot.com. So lastly, I'd like to turn to one of my favorite authors, Dr. Walter Block. I had him on the show a little while back, uh, and he's going to talk about the justifications for U.S. imperialism. There are numerous arguments offered in support of U.S. imperialistic policy. It is not for nothing that America has about 1,000 military bases in some 160 foreign countries. These justifications, although all of them specious, must have at least some significant power. 1. Democracy One case in favor of foreign interventionism is that the North American colossus must export democracy to the backward nations of the world. The difficulty with this is that soldiers are stationed in many nations that are fully democratic. Another awkwardness is U.S. policy toward Egypt. The al-Sisi regime overthrew democratically elected Mohammed Morsi. Did the U.S. sever all relationships with Egypt, at least stop all foreign aid to, to it in protest? To ask this is to answer it. Of course not. So democracy is merely a veneer for U.S. action. And a good thing, too, since Hitler, the real one, not any Near Eastern pretender, rose to power not through a coup d'etat, but via a thoroughly democratic process. Also putting the kibosh on this argument is Hans Hoppe's mag magnificent book, Democracy, the God that Failed, the Economics and Politics of Monarchy, Democracy, and Natural Order. Read that and weep, all those you who support the U.S. military prancing all over the world to bring democracy to the heathen. Remember the hanging chads in the Florida? How would people in the U.S. like it if battalions from Albania, Argentina, or Australia invaded our country in order to repair our pitifully low level of democracy? Not too well, but the powers that be in this country do not cotton up to us, placing ourselves in the moccasins of others, particularly those of foreigners. 2. Being the world's policeman Another defense of U.S. imperialism is that this country must be the policeman of the world. If it could be a good cop, then perhaps, just maybe, there might be some reason to support this, at least for non-libertarians who do not oppose such busybody behavior on principle. But a tiny peek at the record would show this country, instead, taking on the role of Inspector Closeau. Consider the moderate Arab forces, the ones the U.S. is supporting based on credible claims, sold a person to ISIS for beheading for $50,000. ISIS is surging in its war with the Peshmerga based on U.S. weapons. It stole, bought, commandeered from these self-same moderates. The U.S. is the bitter enemy of Iran and Bashar Assad of Syria, and yet who is fighting ISIS? The Hitler du jour? Yes, Iran and Syria. The U.S. drug policy has also undermined countries from Mexico all the way down to South America. There, drug gangs fight government military forces, okay, they're also gangs, on almost even terms. And then there is the U.S. protection of nations such as Afghanistan, Libya, and Iraq that have seen tens of thousands of innocents perish. With, quote, protection like this, the client states of the U.S. would almost be better off with its enmity. 3. Self-defense 
Does anyone remember 9-11 or the numerous occasions when the Drug Enforcement Agency invaded the wrong home and killed innocent children? How would people in the U.S. like it if regiments from Brazil, Burundi, or Botswana invaded our country in order to protect us from this sort of abuse? Not too well, but the powers that be in this country do not cotton to us placing ourselves in the moccasin of others, particularly those of foreigners. The U.S. military pokes its snout into hornet's nests all around the planet. And then our chattering classes are shocked, shocked when some of those insects come here to bite us. Ron Paul spoke truly to Rudy Giuliani when he called this blowback. They are here because we were there, spoke Congressman Paul to a befuddled ex-mayor of New York City. No truer words were ever said. For U.S. Interests then there is the claim that the U.S. must place boots on the ground all around the world based on American interests. What does this mean? If domestic businessmen locate in foreign countries and are mistreated, then the government of this country must step in to protect our vital foreign interests abroad. Sometimes this is couched in terms of oil. We need oil, do we not? Of course we do. Therefore, when our oil companies go to foreign lands, U.S. armies must follow them, lest they come to any harm. One problem with this is that there is no earthly reason to send troops abroad merely to ensure imports. Switzerland also imports oil. It does no such thing. Rather, it depends on the self-interest of the oil exporters. Even apart from developing domestic oil or importing it from a country such as Canada, there is no case whatsoever to meddle in the affairs of other nations just to ensure oil availability. How many free market economists does it take to change a light bulb? None. They leave it to market forces. How many soldiers does it take to ensure imports? None. This, too, can be safely left to market forces. Another difficulty is that this argument in behalf of imperialism is impossible to generalize. If it is justified for U.S. troops to follow American businessmen to foreign lands lest they be mistreated, why does not the same apply the other way around? That is, suppose an entrepreneur from Cuba or China or Chad sets up a company in one of our 50 states, and armies from those nations entered our country on the ground that our judicial system might be unfair to them. How would public opinion in this country react to such goings-on? Not too well, but the powers that be in this country do not cotton to us placing ourselves in the moccasins of others, particularly those of foreigners. The problem here is one of overlapping sovereignties. National governments, not to put too fine a point on the matter, are like scorpions. Leave each of them alone in, on its own patch, and relative peace prevails but put two of them in a bottle and shake it up, and what do you get? Mayhem. That is what. No, the only sane policy is for each nation, up to and including the home of the free land of the brave, to tell its nationals something along the following lines. Look, the world is a dangerous place. We, the government of the U.S., have sovereignty only over our own country. If you go elsewhere, say to Denmark or Dubai or Dominican Republic, whether as a tourist or an investor or a businessman, you go at your own risk. We can only protect you on our own soil. Once you go abroad, you throw yourself at the mercy of whatever rules and regulations they have over there and however they administer their legal system. Similarly, when people from other nations come over here, they place themselves under our rule, for better or for worse would be that every country followed such policies. If so, there would be far less strife in the world. That article was by Walter Block, and uh, it was posted on lewrockwell.com, Justifications for U.S. Imperialism. So I hope that you enjoyed this episode of the Austrian Circle. We are broadcasting out of WHUS stores. This is 91.7. FM, and I hope that you will tune in next week for another episode. We're here on Tuesday at 11 o'clock in the morning. Have a great week. Take care.